So welcome, Thea, to Within Orb, the Celestial Arts Education Library's new podcast, and you are our very first guest. Oh my God, I can't believe it. (laughs) I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for coming, and I'd love to hear, actually, the very first book you ever read about astrology. Um, I think it was, I know it was The Only Way to Learn Astrology, Volume 1. Yeah, because I was nine years old. And um, that's how I like, it was the first time I had that aha moment. And I was at my grandparents house. And I think we had either just come from like a garage sale or someone got it from a garage sale. That's what I remember. Mm -hmm. And no one in my house had interest in astrology, or like studied it seriously. And I don't know how that book got there, but it was supposed to be there for me. And I was like, look at all this stuff you can do. This is amazing. So that you were only nine. Yeah. So like when I say read it, I mean, like I had it. And then when I went to college, I kept it like I kept it with me my whole childhood. <laughs> I'm a keeper collector. Person. Cool. And so then when I went to school, um, I like read it again. And that's when I was trying to, uh, I guess, teach myself. Yeah. You almost got it through osmosis just by having it in your sphere. Yes. One it's very say. synchronistic. <laughs> <laughs> so then what was the second book about astrology you ever read? <laughs> the second book that I read was probably on the heavenly spheres. Okay. So then when I started studying with Sam Reynolds, um, that was the book that he recommended to me. And it was the first time like I still have it. It just really anchored everything in the tradition. Yeah. And I could kind of put aside all the things that I had learned by osmosis and just being, I think, switching from an enthusiast to like actually studying and applying. Yeah. Cause the rules are in there. Yeah. So on the heavenly spheres is a textbook of traditional astrology. Yes. I call it the blue book because it's bright blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then- no, that's a great textbook. I'm, I'm happy Sam recommended that to you. Yeah. So if we get down to nuts and bolts, I'd love to know the really, like if you were on a desert island and you could only take three astrology books with you, what are the top three books that you would need that have influenced you? The top three, and I love that if I were on a desert island, I would be taking astrology books with me. Oh yeah, we don't need any other books. We're only taking astrology books. I mean, ephemeris aside, that's a given, okay? Like we're gonna... (laughs) Yeah, so once I have the ephemeris, the one that I reach for most often right now is the Pharmacus Mythesis book. Um, Just because it's it's like, it's interesting because I was trying to think about my relationship to this book and how I use it, but maybe we'll get into that later. So I think that's that's number one. Um, then number two, I know you had a hand in this book too. Maybe I didn't give you a heads up, but obviously Vadius Mountains. Okay. It's so nice to hold in my hand and not just be a PDF that right? I probably search my desktop for. So very cool. Um, and then because hopefully on the desert island, I will be doing some operations to get off the island. I would bring <laughs> copies, right? Super smart. Would... <laughs> so you're I holding would... a copy of the Picatrix and that's a really great copy, the version of this book actually translated with an introduction by Dan Attrell and David Pereca from the amazing series of books coming out from Pennsylvania State University Press. Mm. So yeah. this is the one that... I actually got to know that this one existed from Nina Griffin. Yes. And I worked with this, I think in Austin's class before I had, I think the Greer one that I worked yeah. with. Very cool. Very cool. So that's the top three. I think so. You know, I'm changeable. So if you ask me another day, <laughs> it could change. Okay. You get a bonus book besides the ephemeris. So what's the fourth one you'd take if you could? Oh, I get a bonus. Book. Okay. So then the bonus one would be Agrippa. Uh, okay. Three books of occult philosophy. That is a um, huge book. Yes, right. Huge. And I and I think I would take it because I've I've had courses that have helped me get through this mm-hmm. and work with it in the way that it should be worked with. I feel like it needs you need someone to help shepherd you through. Say more about that. Well, so like it's not a book that I like recommend to people unless you're in class. So 
studying with Nina Griffin. This is one of our source texts. And then from there, after working with it in class and learning how to, there's like pitfalls. There are, <laughs> there are things that you kind of want to be guided through test and or else you could have like major blowback because what we're doing here is these are source texts that are you know operational focus and were written a long time ago or collected or what have you and so it's just really nice to have some guardrails in before mm. you dive in so if I were to say that in other words, it's as though reading it straight, just sitting down in a chair and deciding to read Agrippa is not going to be as helpful as having conversation around what's actually in it. Yeah, it's it needs to be workshopped, tested, um, compared. I love hearing other people's opinions. So like, I yeah, I completely agree with that. Like, it's not a book that I sit down and enjoy reading. <laughs> Oh no, poor Agrippa. I enjoy what I think. I'm sorry. I think I enjoy the discovery. Yeah. And so, like, I hope we get to talk about that too. Like, the sort oh, of yeah. part that comes where you've integrated it. And then you're like, oh, okay, this is how this fits for me today. For sure. And I feel, let's just start with Agrippa. So, when we look at what he actually did, um, Eric Produce translated Agrippa from Latin freshly from that and um, compiled a bunch of sources his footnotes are so big look at this this is the latest one we have it in the library here that's beautiful three volumes hardback and and the thing is like in speaking with eric it's like agrippa didn't actually write a book he compiled quotes from everything that he was swimming in at the time and i think that's what makes it hard to read because there's these compiled quotes coming from Pacino. Yeah. And then up front, it's like, if you're going to be a sage and do sage work, you need to be like properly prepared. Like, you know, that there is a, like, I always just, I kind of like laugh at how there's like this, things are occult, but like, once you've studied, then you gain entry. It's sort of like there's initiation and having to take these seriously, but then like, once you do it, you're in. And so it's almost like a club, um, I think sometimes and like the sort of how dense and compiled these are, or like sometimes I think, oh, that's a little pitfall or like that's a little misleading or maybe that was translated wrong. Mm. There, there's not like a reading and a um, I can take that wholesale. There's like a reading and vetting part, mm. which I think is always really enjoyable for me. Yeah. Like I enjoy the vetting process. And sometimes it can feel like, frustrating or like I'm not just instantly gaining knowledge but what I do feel like I'm gaining is an experience in how to like either decipher or navigate how do you recommend someone vet what they read in Agrippa for example how do you do it I think if I'm looking to do so usually I start out with like what do I want to do and so am I do I want to do lunar mansion work? Do I want to do planetary magic work? Like, what is the thing? Sometimes I find myself like lately looking for really specific things that either I forgot and are there. So I think having, first of all, like a point of entry is really helpful because then you can kind of put your blinders on. Mm -hmm. And then anything that sort of either bumps up against what you already know, I think it's always a good exercise to trust like, okay, this maybe got translated wrong. and sometimes you'll check the footnote and you'll see, or like this seems like today in 2023, like that there's, we have more source text available to us and there are better ways to like do this operation. There are um, also, if say for instance, like a timing thing requires like, you know, you need the sun and Aries and like back a couple of years ago when like Saturn was in Capricorn and we had that square, it was like, no, we can't. So like figuring out, but maybe I can wait till the sun is in Leo and then do something there. Like trying yeah. to figure out, um, you know, there's the timing aspect that I don't, isn't always made clear. Mm -hmm. um, and so timing is, I think, is also where you would want to like vet and figure out like, am I going to do something that's going to have major blowback? I mean, of course, the way to do that is in class. And then after you finish a class, you never stop doing that. 
Yeah, right. Yeah. Have you tried to do something out of step with the advice given in Agrippa just to test it? Yeah, I'm kind of a for myself, I am a like F around and find out kind of person. Like, you know, say for instance, like working with fixed stars or something like that. Um, and so I think it was like last year I found like a great one for Sirius, but like Mars was opposing it. And I was like, ah, oh, can I try it? Can I try it? Is this gonna be like um and then actually listen, I actually don't remember if I did it. And I want to say I actually didn't, but I had a whole operation planned out. Yeah. And, and then I just got a bad feeling. <laughs> like, okay. like I'm not gonna make something yeah. that captures this moment. Um, even though it was a beautiful, serious moment. Um, serious, the fixed star. <laughs> I was about to say. <laughs> I, I know. Um, so I think, yes, there have been times for myself, I'm willing, I'm willing to experiment. Yeah, I love that. I love that because it's almost like you're saying like, okay, it got passed down from the sages that we need to be paying attention to the moon, not being in via combusta, but let's just see if that's still true right like what's the worst that can happen actually with being a combusta like let's see. <laughs> well the thing about that is the precession of the the equinox right so the fixed yeah. stars that were behind the tropical zodiac at that time might have moved on and yes. so we have to readjust our via combusta tropical pathway exactly right? and that that echoes across two to lunar mansions so I went through a whole thing where I was like, you know, I think lunar mansions should be tropical zodiac, but I've also learned it like people are like, you need to adjust okay. um, back to sidereal. So like, just that's another experiment I've been doing for like, really? Yeah. Um, I had no idea. That's awesome. Yeah, I compare. Um, and have you gotten anything so far? I it's been so spotty. Listen, okay. Okay. Now, now I feel like I need to delve into it further. It takes a lot of time. Right. Um, but for me, I do lunar mansions off the tropical zodiac. Okay. And it works. Although I understand mansions are set by the constellation. Like that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. It's like, yeah. In so, terms of like the stacking of the spheres, right? Is that what you mean? Because the mansions of, are in like the outer shell of the car. But the lunar ocean. mansions themselves like have an origin that are fixed to the constellations. And so mm themselves and the tropical zodiac yes of course it's like shifted and so i mean there's been you know astro magicians who are doing this work and they have different reasons but like for me this is like one of the instances where i'm like but what works now and i the only way that i know it is if i run it through the experience of testing it myself mm -hmm. and you know like too like the thing is you know we've got outer planets and like, like what's happening when you like add a little dose of Neptune? Like I can't unsee that Neptune is right there. Like that is a perfect word for Neptune too. get a dose. <laughs> Just kind of like intoxicating. What's the, the verb thing? for Pluto, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I know. I know. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, what would happen? I think also in terms of like focus, like if you're focusing that far out beyond Saturn, Maybe it comes into play, but then what happens when you're not focused on that? But when you talk about the tropical zodiac being the tempo setter for your work with lunar mansions, I'm thinking about that platonic cosmology that's got the earth in the center and then the spheres, mm. and then you get to that eighth sphere of the fixed yes. stars. And then you get the, and I've, I've like read, like, then the lunar mansions are there, like on the outside, but the moon is on the inside, right? So yeah, is that like, that's not how I even think about like it being that far away. I don't know. There's mm -hmm. like a different visual that conjures up my head when I work with lunar mansions. It what is like, it? It's kind of like the moon goes to a place and takes like visits a spirit because each of the lunar mansions have ruling spirits. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is and I feel like they each have a tone. So I started a project, abandoned it maybe I should actually finish it where I started writing like hymns to the lunar mansion spirits. Oh, um, and it was a project of tracking. Once I started paying attention when the moon was, you know, in her Zodiac is, you know, 
-hmm. not a solar zodiac it's the moon's zodiac in other words um and then noticing like funny things would happen like I'm not going to have the examples now but like on a day where the moon was in a certain mansion that had to do with like toxins I like got bit by like a hornet like this is like weird and like I don't know that I would have seen that if I was just paying to where the moon was according to like the 12 signs solar that zodiac that we always use yeah. but like because I was started paying attention then like all these things happened and I was like I don't know this also feels a little scary like I don't want to start to like welcome these things but then I would write like it would inspire me to write a little hymn yeah. of how we can get the best use out of it because the thing that I've noticed about I know we're here to talk about books but <laughs> no this is awesome I love it <laughs> Um, the thing that relates to like, I find with the lunar mansion spirits is like, I feel like we call them planets a lot, or like there's more people doing that now, but I feel like when you call the name of a lunar mansion spirit, it really does. You get this like, huh? Like this kind of like, okay, you're like, it's louder or the more noticeable to that spirit is kind of how I imagine it. That's like my little visual for it. So I have like these little comfy layers where the moon travels to. Hmm. So when you compare... Like actually, I mean, it's more like um, how would you categorize the Picatrix depiction of the lunar mansions versus what you get in Agrippa? Um, so when I go to the Picatrix, let's just open it up. I have like there's like it's more like it's filling it in for me. Mm-hmm. So that with the part that I have tagged in the Picatrix, there's like two sections that are talking about lunar mansions. Um, you get like what the mansion is called, um, and it, where it begins and where it ends. And you can get like a certain meaning of what this is good for. So like the third lunar mansion, which has like amazing properties and the moon is about to get there soon, um, because it begins, it's at the end of Aries and the beginning of Taurus, like up to six Taurus. Um, So yeah, the moon's about to enter that. Um, (laughs) And it's really good for like growing things over time, um, works of alchemy. And so like, I find myself going here when sometimes I'm confused. I don't know, the Picatrix just has like a really good, um, it's like a reminder for me. Cause like, I don't have these memories. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I just go here. I mean, I know them, but then, then if you go to, so that's in book. I'm in book. Let's see. For the Lunar Mansions in the version of the Picatrix, that's in book one, chapter four. Okay. And then if you go to book four, book four it just lists them all again. Mm-hmm. And it does tell you their spirit names and like more about like what to do and how to invoke. So then it'll say like the third mention the third mansion has his names. This is the Pleiades. It's not anymore. Um, and then say, <laughs> oh, Anuncia, such and such. And so it's got more of like an operational bent yeah. um, within here. Let's see, see that. that. Yeah. A seated woman holding her right hand above her head and dressed in clothes. Very important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah so I've made that one and I was like oh I think I might make that one again I, I have um a image talisman that I met made during that operation that I've used for a couple of years that's like really beautiful mm-hmm. but I actually also like what's kind of going on right now mm-hmm. like Venus just, into just entering Pisces, Pisces. yeah know, yeah really that um when the moon gets to the Taurus part of this mansion it's like really mm-hmm. sweet Very cool. um so for me, I think the lunar mansions are actually clear in the Picatrix. Mm-hmm. I'm like now flipping pages. Awesome. But I think I mean, I'm also hearing from you, like reading is one thing that's more of the sort of semi-initiation, but actually taking the time to like put the book down and do the work is really what gets you to know how to do the work in a way. And matching it, yeah, to my loved experience. So, like, if we were to give you an example, like the um, when I'm talking about Firmicus, this is another book where there's like really fun things in here. Like in the beginning, 
he's talking about like what kind of life an astrologer ought to have oh it's yeah just, yeah that's awesome I've only um, read the eighth book hmm? in Firmicus I've only read the eighth book so what oh. kind of life does he say an astrologer should have let's see <laughs> I can tell you is that in the beginning yes it's in the beginning um and I totally forgot it but it's it's worth a reread it's like kind okay. of funny because like who can say I don't know <laughs> let me see if I can wow oh I got yeah. it what sort okay. of life and what sort of practices astrologers ought to have um and it's really short and some of it's really archaic, like you should have a wife and a home. Um, yeah. Everybody wife up. Um, I know, right? But um, what I do like about it, which I've flagged here now, I do remember this now. Nor should you join in conversations secretly with anyone, but openly, just as I said above, under the gaze of all, you should reveal the learning of this divine art. There's like little gems in there. Awesome. Um, and it's really just like, study hard and like be a good person and like don't use this knowledge for ill mm -hmm. um then there's like some things about like if you're going to work with the emperor's destiny like basically don't do it <laughs> that's funny i love the way in the back that eighth book just to connect to this text with you um there's all of these horoscopes just from reading the ascendant degree mm. So I looked it up for some of my friends and it's like, you're going to be an herbalist, witch, and it's like, she is. <laughs> yes, yes. Some of them are super violent though. Ascendant, like what term or bound it's in is like, yeah. also colors it in this way that like, I was rereading re this again recently too. And I was like, oh yeah, that's like, that's such a nugget that like you forget. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love looking at bound rulers of the ascendant. Yeah. Cause it's like the way I learned it from Bernadette Brady was it's the material manifestation of a thing. Mm. is how something actually shows up in the world so if your term ruler is saturn what are you going to look like if it's mars buddy you know like that whole thing so yeah i didn't know that was in there um where i was gonna go with the story i think we were talking about like vetting yeah so like, you can do that too with like your chart obviously like i know astrologers do this and thinking about like how it's shown up for your life and i had this really the reason why this is one of my favorite books is like I saw it operate really clearly in my life. There's these like planetary combos that Permacus gets into. Yeah. That are like, so for instance, Mars and Saturn together. Mm -hmm. And then it'll do Mars and Saturn, but depending, it could be a square, it can be a trine, it could be whatever the aspect is. And then so if you have that combination, and I learned this in Austin's class, like we delved, this is where I delved into this book, Austin Copics, year three. And we went over like thinking about how these planetary combinations showed up in our lives. Mm -hmm. And I had this really weird, I have Mars square Saturn in my chart by whole sign. So that's fun. And I was like, what is that? How does that show up for me? And like, one of the things is, is that it will, the native will lose their like inheritance or something really weird like that. And also mm -hmm. like the mom will die young mm. or like, relatively young. I have to find it so I can read the quote. Okay, and find it. That's yeah. really fucking what happened to me. <laughs> so like my mom died young. She died young for her life and mm -hmm. also for my life. Mm -hmm. So I was in my twenties. And through like a series of really unfortunate, like weird things that happened, the, a lot of the things that possessions that she owned mm -hmm. are just forever gone. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're gone. Like there's no getting them back. And, and it's really interesting because I sat with that and I was like, you know, the, the thing that I always lost is like, there's like photos and all mm -hmm. the stuff she owned and things that were hers that I wish I like physically had picture like whatever it was um that she kept and seeing that show up in this like just really quick couple paragraph delineation was like mind-blowing for me and I actually had to sit with it for a couple months and be like what does this mean yeah. and if I had read this before my mom's death like I would have 
been freaked out. So obviously like, like really grateful that I read it when I was ready to. Right. And also like, so then what do I do with this? And I think for me, like, it just shows me, you know, there's lots of scary things in some of these traditional texts, but like the thing is, is that it doesn't, it can play out in like a, a way that fits your life now. Like I didn't lose a monetary inheritance. I lost something that was like sentimental Mm -hmm. and that I never thought I would lose. Right. Which actually makes the pain harder because you're thinking it's always going to be there and then it isn't. Yeah. 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 Where are you with it now? You know, um, like with Firmicus and just the, that, that lived experience of seeing something be foretold reading it after the fact with hindsight and then yeah just like then now you're a transmitter of the tradition to people who come to you for consult right yeah I think um that we still always have I think this is where like remediation comes into play and sitting with these difficult signatures so that it's not really like a matter of this is really scary or I don't want this thing to happen with me But like, if I'm going to live Mars Saturn, like that there's things I can do from like a remedial standpoint that build a relationship with my Mars and build Mm -hmm. a relationship with my Saturn, depending on what, you know, in that moment I'm willing to, you know, enter into a relationship to and like constantly dialogue with it. And it's given me so much richness and so much context that there's there's a trust that I have in this art, not just from reading the words on the page, but from Mm -hmm. understanding the ways in which they played out and could have played out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's a very fascinating line to toe between like appreciating the tradition through textuality, but having to marry that with mentors who are guiding through the text and then also lived experience of just time paying attention to the movement of the moon paying attention to the working you want to do evaluating it and that's not in a book (laughs) (laughs) you know sometimes I wish it were yes yeah right (laughs) I almost wonder though if it were in a book if we would be able to really truly read it and understand it do you know what I mean yeah yes because you're you're transmitting embodied wisdom through having gone through these texts yes as an operator yes and I've also learned lots of things and read things and I'm like I don't know if this is for me to pick up right now and I also Mm -hmm. feel like that's also okay Mm -hmm. um and I'm trying to think if I have a good example of that but you know like there are so many things that are now available to just like order and get yeah and that's not the same thing as like obviously like sitting and like earning wisdom from it yeah like I've done the same like I have books that I've ordered because I was like I should read that but either I'm not really called to right now or I'll see it make the rounds and I'll get it but I haven't actually read it yet I still think it's in your field though and osmosis you know it just kind of I think (laughs) they kind of it keeps the temperature like this room is filled with all of the books written by our astrological ancestors and it is loud in here like Oh my God, I bet. I love that word, astrological ancestors. Yeah. It's beautiful. And there's so many, it's like, there's, you don't have enough, no one has enough lifetime left to read them all. So if you were going to give a reading list to someone just starting, what would you tell them to pick up first? I love the way that Demetra George writes. Like, I love the way that she explains astrology. So if like, if someone um wants to it's it's like say like somebody wants to enter the field and like start you know talking about their friends charts to them and maybe start embarking on readings I feel like the the one that she has oh yeah astrology and the authentic self I love that one Mm. because it's like at that point you've got all this you know what the planets are um and usually there's that point where you gather all the information and say they're just starting out and they want to sort of synthesize, but you find that like it scatters as soon as you start to bring it all together. I find that that book is really good for that. Very cool. And like, in terms of like, what to prioritize. Yeah. What would be your next recommendation for them? 
Mm. I'm like looking behind me. <laughs> um, I mean, I love 36 Secrets. Okay. Um, Susie Chang's book. Mm -hmm. I found myself going to this often just because like, this isn't from, this is astrology and then tarot and the Deccans. So mm -hmm. I go to this one a lot because I think it's nice to have visuals other than just like these sort of, like you can anchor what um, parts of the Zodiac look like mm -hmm. and how they show up in the, like tarot archetypes. Um, and I feel like that's also really helpful for someone starting out um, to get like a sort of visual conjured image of what are we even talking about here? Very cool. Very cool. So um, when you're making your images, do you do the art yourself? I do. Awesome. Yeah. I've, <laughs> um, and so I've tried, I've really learned not to judge it and like to just ex have fun in the experience of making something. And like, I'm not the best like by hand drawer, but I do love collaging. Like I've loved that since I was a little girl, I used to have like stacks of magazines and make images. And I do that even from time to time when I'm bored. So like, that's always a fun way um, for me to put together almost like a symbolic representation of what I think it looks like. Mm -hmm. And once I let it go that it had to look like the thing, it was a lot more fun. Very cool. Very cool. Do you think the, the, the working like also guides you with that in a way? Like it's like mm. you're like engaging something that's a little bit outside of your capacity to be in control. Yeah. Yeah. But that, so that cool. is, a, that is a part of what we're doing here is like sitting with the energies and then making the thing at the moment and just like not judging it, but it's beautiful because you made it, you know, yeah. you yeah. gave it a little physical home. Yeah. Are these, are these images that you've made going to stay private or do you think you might share them at some point? I, I, I have, they're probably private for now, mm -hmm. but what I do sometimes feel called to do is like take a picture of my altar. Mm -hmm. And because that to me is that that's like the whole presentation. And so I have a lot of, I have so much fun, like buying the right color candles and like, making candles like from beeswax and like doing the dipping um doing what what, what other kind of things do I mean so it's like getting the right kind of flowers correspondences or like I like creating the whole thing mm -hmm. and like I have like even since I was a kid I would like ask my mom to be like can we do a seance and she would take me to go buy candles and like glitter for the table and it's like that same kind of like working energy yeah. that I, I love and I really relate to. Very cool. I should share more photos though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in going back to Agrippa, um, he articulates that the things that the planets like aren't just a matter of correspondence, but that they're actually like the earthly manifestation of the planet itself. Like if you cut yourself, that's literally Mars on your hand. And mm. if you eat a piece of garlic, you're like chewing Mars, you know? So in a way, like going through this like ceremonial presentation and gathering is actually like you're meeting them like tangibly. Yes, because that's the only way we can engage in this reality, like is to create a little a little sphere of what this would look like down on Earth. You know. I love that. And then sometimes there's like cute things that I do, like even like today's Venus Day and I'm wearing green or like sometimes I'm like, I need a little energy and I'll get my nails done like bright red. Um, and sometimes I'm like, this is this is how I'm showing up for this planet. And I kind of sense that I need that. Or like adding lemon water because it's deep winter and we're in Aquarius season. So like adding lemon to my water has been like- Literally drinking the sun. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> If the sun doesn't want to come out, I will drink it. Oh, wow. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you're like living the planets. They're, they're in your cohort. I do think about, you know, I find myself too, like even in my household, I do a lot of the cooking and the shopping and it's like, okay, like 
on this day, are we on Tuesdays? Like maybe I'll make the red meat. We'll eat an animal on Monday. Well, maybe we'll just go meatless and have like a lot of cheese and dairy. Like there is, <laughs> there's a way that I probably do too much, but it's fun. I don't yeah. know. It can make the mundane um, magical. Mm-hmm. It's just like always what I'm returning to. I think. And then that way too, if if I'm reading or I'm learning about an operation you know, I'm not just doing it one time because I need something. I'm like carrying this through, through like a daily lived experience. Right. So that I can be some, yeah. So that it, how, how you're saying like that thing is the planet. It's not just yeah. like a correspondence. Yeah. Well, and it's good to avoid transactional relationships, right? <laughs> like, yes. you know, you have this, I mean, I can feel it. I didn't even think about green. Um, but yes, it is Friday. And like, here you are wearing green, like you bring in Venus to the table, you know? I hope so. <laughs> so, um, any other books you want to bring up that have changed your life as an astrologer? Changed my life. I think, um, I'm looking behind me. Sometimes I'm looking behind you too. <laughs> I'm like watching. I think those are the ones I'm going to do now. Like a lot of the other books I've gotten in tandem again with like classes and courses. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes I like, they're like astrology adjacent or they've changed my life. I think as like a researcher or somebody learning more about a period in time so like Mm -hmm. also I feel like in addition to astrology books it's really good if you're interested in that period of history to just like go deep into that and then then recircle back to whatever is anchoring you in the astrology Mm -hmm. and take that with you too like just as the capacity to do research on my own um has been something that I've been working with since Uranus entered my ninth. (laughs) (laughs) Whenever Uranus went into Taurus in like 2018. Yeah. She's like, oh my God. It 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 I did feel that jolt. So I don't I don't think I have any other books at this moment, but yeah. Yeah. So widen the lens. Widen the cultural lens. Yeah. So you've brought up the Maternus's Methesis and Balin's Anthology, but those yeah. seem like kind of diametrical, right? Like they're not quite the same vantage point on Hellenistic. So could you say more about your take on how they present that era of astrology differently? Well, I'll tell you, I mean, I use, I entered Balin because of, zodiacal releasing Mm -hmm. um and so I think for me I get like could I say more about how they're different I think I entered them for different reasons Mm -hmm. like and I kind of do a thing where first of all for me like I don't read these books from start to finish I read them in different order so they they kind of live in my head as sort of like a mixed collection if I'm working with them at the same time which I kind of have been and then like balance again like I feel like I usually because it you know the format was so that pdf that everyone worked with for so long it was really like what do I need and what what do I enter with to get the most out of Mm -hmm. so to be honest, like these are my favorite books because I feel like I can go through enter and get something really sound mm-hmm. about whatever it is I need, but then I kind of back out. Mm-hmm. So I'm not like, for me, like to read them from start to finish is different. Like I would maybe do, which I also have here, like a Demetra George, if I wanted to be like guided through, because I think mm-hmm. it is hard to like read this whole thing and digest it and make meaning of it. Yeah. Um, it's It's been an easier experience to read in context of like topic by topic, then I would recommend the, this is volume one. I don't have her volume two yet, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes back to what you were saying in the beginning of, you know, reading these works, at least these works that you've chosen in the context of a class or some kind of person who can guide you to 
get to that aphorism and unpack it in a way because it isn't meant to be read start to finish actually like it's almost like you're sort of like hey what do you think about this and you know firmicus maternus is like that's what you get for that planetary combo and then you kind of move on yes you know yeah and sometimes i find myself frustrated a little bit to be honest i'm like oh but there's more like there's probably more um and so like where's the more is also where i'm interested like the things they're not saying yeah maybe or, it's in Saul or Bonatti <laughs> like those guys came in and filled it in you know <laughs> yeah and then like the more for me in terms of like so then you can back out and go into other texts and link those together um and that's what you're saying like this whole art takes like it could be like several lifetimes and I would love to have those lifetimes <laughs> yeah right yeah I think we get it in community though, because, you know, you cover certain ground with your work and others cover other ground and there's like conversations like this, you know, we're sharing and sort of expanding our absolutely knowledge base together. And even I was thinking about this too, because we're sitting down and having a podcast and I was like, oh my God, I learned so much from like when my daughter was born, like pushing her in the stroller and putting in a podcast because I actually didn't have, or audiobooks or something like that. Like I didn't have the capacity to sit down and read all the mm -hmm. time, but that that learning also happened in that way too. And like yeah. where we are today in 2023, it's like people may enter through an episode like this and then be inspired to like, go get the book, which mm -hmm. is freaking awesome. Yeah. And it makes me really excited about like all the techniques that we have and like actually how they can be deepened. Yeah. What are some of your favorite techniques to use that you kind of put in practice more often than not? I mean, I, I really, I go to zodiacal releasing and I think it's also cause I like kind of stuff that's like a little weird. A little, <laughs> What's weird like about you, that? <laughs> if you have necessary, like if I go to my local community, I go to gathering with other astrologers maybe now but I you not everyone's going to be doing ZR like maybe maybe people will know about it or have that thing where I think the reason also to I appreciate balance I felt a connection like I felt like ZR was really hidden hitting for me and I could see it show up in clients charts in a way that like it just I've seen you know, I think it is a sort of a, what do you naturally gravitate and how is it filtered through you? So I've seen some people be able to be like, this is hitting. And then some people be like, absolutely not. Um, but I really enjoy it as like, even after the session is done to continue to follow like a timeline. And I find that so beautiful that we can have these sort of like, um, these times within times. Mm -hmm. That's a nice way of putting it the nested yeah. periods. Yeah, I mean, I really like, um, what are some other texts? So, so I took Horary last year, like at SCA, like even though I had learned it before and had been practicing it and, but that also helped to further like, I think, my my relationship to astrology just outside of natal and to be like this is every single time I'm just blown away and then but there's all these rules and I'm not necessarily like a rules person but yeah. like that that then there's like beauty in the rules and um yeah that's also been I think that's not a technique that's a branch of astrology but I feel like we should just mention horror because it's it's fun. Yeah, yeah. No, I think um, if you are only coming at astrology from a modern standpoint and you meet horary, it's like, whoa. <laughs> I know. And then sometimes I'm like, man, like I like if we had had this rigorous of a practice that was able to continue along all the like periods in history where there's like religious persecution and things being watered down and texts being lost. Like if we could have had this, like where would we be <laughs> for, so, so, you know, for so many centuries? It's just, it's, it's really, um, 
phenomenal. But in terms of like what other techniques do I bring to the table? Um, I mean, I kind of just, I'm, I'm, I guess I don't always think about it in terms of technique. I just sit down and I'll see what strikes me first. But I mean, I do what everyone does probably like, you know, perfections and time period, like what Lords, it, like all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it's nice to hear, I think, the the sort of heat seeking missile vibe with a chart. Like you look at a chart and you're like, well, we're going to talk about that. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's like it's telling you like this is the topic, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's coming up now. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you for spending the afternoon with me. This is fun. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. And if you um ever want to come back, you're always welcome to talk more books and more everything astrology. I love it. Thank you so much.